Um, we're going to uh, turn the morning over to Dr. Trotman to talk about something that I hope everybody's aware of, but certainly the uh, evolution in how we think about the operative procedure is more than just the operative procedure, but the entire sort of perioperative experience. And there's been a lot of work done on how to evolve that, and specifically in the Enhanced Recovery After Surgery program, that is a national effort as well, and Catherine's been leading that for us here for uh, quite some time, and we're anxious to get an update. So thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. welcome. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Is this working all right? Okay. So William Mayo once said, the best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. However, often what we consider to be the best interest of the patient may not be. And uh, often our surgical forefathers have established traditions and we abide by them. And um, sometimes that's not always the best thing to do. Uh, patient enemy number two is the consequences of delaying oral intake after surgery. Um, that can lead to poor nutritional status, prolonged healing. Uh, and wound dehiscent and asthmatic leak and wound infection, as well as an increase in the inflammatory response. Often patients who uh, are, have prolonged ventilator days aren't eating, and um, often that leads to prolonged ileus. Patient enemy number three is the narcotics. Uh, there are, as you know, many consequences of excessive narcotics, including decreased respiratory drive, um, delayed mobilization, and also the prolonged ileus. And then, of course, Patient enemy number four, leaving them in their hospital beds for a prolonged period of time, and that can certainly lead to aspiration pneumonia, pressure sores, uh, emboli, ulcers. So the problem is that often our patients are poorly informed about their perioperative course and what to expect and the risks and complications. And we often keep them immobile, uh, starve them, and that all leads to muscle mass uh, reduction and deconditioning with many of the perioperative complications as high as 50%. So one of the solutions is to target this, attack this in a multimodal fashion with uh, surgical pathways. Uh, successful inflammation of these tasks and these pathways certainly includes many people, many of whom are in this room and many who I will mention, but it's a collaboration between physicians, nurses, dietitians, uh, pharmacists, etc. So just as a brief summary, the enhanced recovery after surgery um, involves having the patient involved in their care as early as the clinic visit and all the way through the hospitalization to home and is a collaboration between um, many, many groups here. Uh, there are many ERAS components that I'll touch upon. Uh, this is just a little brief uh, schematic. Um, enhanced recovery programs have been in place for many years in many different disciplines, including uh, colon surgery, uh, Whipple's, uh, recently cystectomy was uh, added to the UC Davis uh, ERAS program, and gastrectomies. Um, is the ERAS, though, just a catchy new name for old principles? Uh, Kellett from Scandinavia in the 90s uh, had his elderly patients uh, with a median age of 81 stay for two days for their laparoscopic colon resection. And what he showed was that he can make a dramatic improvement in their mobilization and, and the return of bowel function by immediately feeding them postoperatively and getting them out of bed. They all had return of bowel function by postoperative day number two. And their median length of stay was two days. That was in the middle of my residency. Uh, so this was already quite a long time ago, and the America has essentially just started to embrace these principles in the last uh, half, of, half of the decade. Uh, so as mentioned, in the 90s, it was started in Scandinavia, and uh, the first ERAS pathways were developed in Europe in 2000, and then the first guidelines published in 2005. The American College of Surgeons has just recently, in um, 2014, started to uh, push some of these ERAS principles. Uh, here at UC, um, at UC Davis, we've been involved in this University of California high-risk colorectal surgery uh, intervention program. And this was um, essentially founded 
by Michael Stamos, a colorectal surgeon at UC Irvine, and some of the other colorectal surgeons uh, in the UC system. There are five that got together, including myself, and essentially wanted to put our heads together and do best practices for all the UC colorectal surgeons. That was the development of the UC Davis High-Risk Colorectal Surgery Intervention Program. <laughs> and what we wanted to do was to basically try to standardize some of our best practices and come up with a relatively um, consistent post-operative and perioperative program. In 2013, uh, we got together and applied for a grant with the Office of the President with the Center for Health Quality and Innovation and uh, we received a three-year grant to work on some of these principles here at UC Davis. Uh, we have uh, PIs from each of the different institutions, and next week's uh, PI is speaking, uh, UCLA uh, Clifford Coe, who's a colorectal surgeon. He's speaking at the Research uh, Quality Day. So our goal was to basically uh, determine what our core set of standards would be and try to come up with a consistent and comprehensive plan for all the UCs. We focus on elective colon resection, so none of the emergency ACS uh, type cases. They had to be resections and not just colostomies or colostomy takedowns. And we looked at a lot of the high-risk patients, such as the ileostomy patients, because we thought we could make the most impact on the most severe of this population. So in 2013, we just had a, some baseline data acquisition until 2015. Uh, and then in 2015, we our goal was to have all of our systems in place and really give a good push for implementation. Now, um, some of these things did not have to be created de novo because here at UC Davis, we already had some of the systems in place, uh, perioperative warming, um, oxygen, et cetera. But many places didn't have um, all of the elements. And so we just tried in that initial period to get all groups on board, um, and you'll see there are certain things that, that I did over that period um, to get our UC Davis uh, program consistent with some of the others. Unlike um, the, the, what you might be used to, the prospective randomized trials where we have one patient gets consented and has essentially one major intervention, we basically had a bundle of changes. And so this wasn't actually something that had to go through the IRB, but we put it through our, our IRB anyways, Dr. Palmieri helped me get that through, and um, our uh, uh, wonderful research nurses um, also helped us to get that through. Even though we had an umbrella from UC Irvine, we still put it through the UC Davis just to be um, extra safe, um, that there would be no issues with that. What's also important is that we encourage everyone to participate, but no one is mandated to participate. So. You don't have to give your patient uh, the pre-op heparin or the enteric, but these are things we're just letting people know about these changes so that they can implement them if they like. I think a lot of it is just awareness of what the best practices are. I think that's one of the main reasons these, these things are successful. So there were many groups that I collaborated with and engaged in order to have this happen, starting with the EMR and IT, um, Vince Montez and Amy Tan, and with pharmacy, Erica Cutler, infectious disease. Stu Cohen has a, has a parallel C, um, University of the President grant looking at a surgical site infection. And so we overlap quite a bit with them because of the colorectal cases. Um, nutrition, Jessica LaFarce is here, and, um, and um, Linda Gray were instrumental in the nutrition aspect of this. Um, the SGI faculty and residents have been um, very instrumental in that they are working with us to implement some of these changes. Dr. Ali just told me I made sure they stayed strict with the IV fluids over the weekend on my on one of my colovescal fistula patients. Um, and the residents, um, Dr. Leshiker was very helpful in helping me to get the order set so that it's user friendly for all of you. Um, Katrina Falwell, I don't know if she's here, but she was very she's been very helpful with getting getting the word out, helping me with all of the uh, different components. And then Liz and the Cyprus nurses um, have been very helpful in, in making sure the patient gets the education. The Nisquip surgical case reviewers with uh, Kim Brinks and um, uh, Ann Martyr. And then the, the HCAPS analyst, um, David Frankenberger, is our present, present helper. These are the different grand rounds and in-services that um, I've given with the help of Katrina. Um, 
to these different groups just to get the word out. Every other month I meet with um, our surgical residents to make sure that they stay compliant. The MIS fellows have been very helpful as well. So what I'm going to do is just briefly go through the pre-op, peri-op, and post-op phase and then show you some of the results. But this is essentially to show you about the development rather than um, the outcomes since the outcomes are still all pending. So in terms of perioperative education, this is probably one of the most important areas where I think that we can all make a dramatic difference. Um, we have developed a, a letter that, that goes directly to the patient that outlines these components so they know what to expect. I think that's a big part of this is patient expectation and understanding um, what, what's ahead of them. Uh, with the collaborative, we've developed a perioperative video. We were going to just use a post-op, but I find that pre-op is also helpful so the patient can already start studying and, and knowing what to expect. And then um, we use the risk calculator. For the risk calculator. In terms of um, the nutritionist, you'll see momentarily there are many different components in the pre-op, peri-op, and post-op area. Uh, surgical site infection. Um, Initially, we were, we were being very selective about this, but I'll show you that actually it's come full circle and, and we probably should be as aggressive as we have always been. And then the chlorhexidine um, showers comes from the SSI group um, that I was um, one of the co-members of um, and we're doing their chlorhexidine showers before surgery. And then, of course, smoking cessation and uh, trying to stop the, the alcohol. So. Patient education, again, is very important because you're psychologically preparing the patient and the family for what they uh, are to encounter. This is just very briefly a sample of the letter. It goes on nice letterhead, but it basically goes through all the different components. I took a few snapshots of the video that, um, that we put together. This is Ario. He just, he's a Yale first-year surgery resident. He interviewed here. Um, but super guy, and during his research year, he, uh, we gave him a little bit of uh, money to put together uh, a video that has four different components. Um, this one focuses on ileostomy, so I just took a few snapshots from the video. That way I didn't have to make sure the video worked. You can just get an idea. So he made this little apron here with the, the bowel, and then here he shows you how the ostomy goes on the, the ostomy appliance goes onto the stoma. And um, uh, there's a lot of little diagrams like this. Um, these are just examples of what a good ostomy looks like. Um, you might recognize that. That one was mine. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I did not contribute any to these, but I have, mine have not always looked perfect like that. So just to give the patient some ideas of, of what, um, what to expect. He, he's very engaging in these videos and, and um, writes, and we have question and answer at the end of them for the patients. Um, here we show like, how the patient can measure their ileostomy into a urinal, um, which has a nice handle. And we ask them to record uh, their outputs. And um, we got to do that for Ms. Lopez, by the way. Um, OK. Um, also very important is dehydration. And, um, and he spends a, a minute or so on dehydration and Pedialyte and how we can keep um, ourselves hydrated. These are on the UC Davis TVs. Um, Ton helped me get that on the TV. And um, it's on the Tiger system. So um, you just have to look up ileostomy, and all four of those videos pop up for the patients. They can also ha get it on a CD-ROM, or we have a little spiral booklet, or it's on YouTube also. So you just, if you just put in ileostomy and look for ARIA with those glasses, they're hard to miss. Um, of course, preoperative -op optimization is always um, crucial for our patients, uh, particularly um, for some of their chronic processes, if we have the time to manage them. Um, this snack questionnaire came from the nutrition committee. We were looking for an assessment tool of the patient. There are many complicated ones, but what, what, um, what uh, Linda and Jessica found was this snack questionnaire, which just has some very simple um, questions. With, and this one was a validation study with almost 1,000 patients. It was previously used for inpatients, but we applied it to the outpatient setting. Just three simple questions. Did you lose weight? and it gives you some um, uh, parameters. Did you experience a decrease in appetite, and did you use supplemental drinks? And then you get certain points for those questions. And as you can see here, there's um, quite a high specificity and uh, negative predictive value. 
And so this is actually on the, the first order set where the snack gets um, completed. And if the patient has a, um, two or more points, then a dietitian consult post update two is generated. This is just a brief um, glimpse of the risk calculator that um, is from the American College of Surgeons and gives us an idea of the perioperative risk of the patient. Uh, it's a tool for all of us to know about and use. I see that people use this selectively. Um, for instance, if a patient's on the fence or um, you really want them to understand the risk and complications. But I find that um, not everybody is using these, especially like if they have a cancer that there aren't a lot of options for the patients. Um, some find that this might be just too much for them to handle. But just that you all know that it's there, just riskcalculator.facs.org. So three new order sets were created for this project, one for use in the clinic, one for the pre-op holding area, and one for the post-op. Um, you can access these with smart sets or with the order sets um, tab. So for the first one, um, if you just put in CRE RAS, they, they all pop up. And just very briefly, I have a few snapshots of a few of the different uh, um, things. These are for the clinic nurses to make sure that they get the chlorhexidine and the carbohydrate drink, which we'll talk about it. Um, this is how this is what the snack questionnaire looks like. And if the patient's identified as malnourished, they'll get the dietitian consult. Um, so the last thing I wanted to talk about in this section was about full bowel prep. Are we coming full circle? So the traditional methods of mechanical and antibiotic bowel prep had come into scrutiny over the past decade. We were thinking maybe people don't need bowel preps. In, front, um, in fact, one of our UCLA collaborators um, doesn't even do bowel preps for rectal cancer. Um, but um, the Cochrane database in 2014 showed that there were significantly more infections in patients who just had IV antibiotics versus those that had oral and IV antibiotics. Our risk ratio was 0.5. And also, the Michigan looked at the, their database of 1914 19, um, cases, and they looked at full prep with the mechanical on the PO versus no prep at all in propensity match pairs. And what they found was if you did do the full bowel prep, that there were less superficial uh, skin infections, less organ space infections, and less post-op C. diff. It was hard to say um, definitively whether it was the mechanical bowel prep or the oral antibiotics, but there's another trial that showed that it's probably more the oral antibiotics, um, but often patients will become ill with those, but that probably is um, more of the factor. So this is the bag that um, Grace and Liz helped get together. It has the chlorhexidine, the boost breeze, and the incentive spirometer that we're now giving to all of our patients. In it is a folder with the patient letter and a lot of ileostomy, uh, something I got off the website for um, the Ostomy Association. So in terms of the day of surgery, the intraoperative phase, um, we're minimizing fasting, uh, giving the carbohydrate drink two to three hours the, uh, before surgery. That's still variable. Um, pharmacologic interventions, making sure that they get their um, heparin, potentially regional blocks, if that's something that we can do since we want to minimize the narcotics, um, appropriate SSI prophylaxis, the assessment for nausea, vomiting, and the post-op ileus prevention. MIS, if we, minimally invasive surgery, if we are able to do that for our patients, and goal-directed therapy. So in regards to minimizing the pre-op fasting, there really is no scientific evidence behind the dogma of fasting the night before surgery. So here at UC Davis, our current guidelines are two hours for clear liquids and six for a light meal. Uh, recently, there uh, has been the implementation of a preoperative carbohydrate drink, and um, I'll show you a little bit more about what we have here at UC Davis now. And um, what they found with this drink is that they mitigate the post-operative insulin resistance, uh, which is resulting in better glucose control perioperatively, as well as preserving some of the muscle strength, the nitrogen balance. And I even saw one paper that showed an improvement in cardiac function. Uh, Echo was better if you did give them the carbohydrate drink. Um, this is uh, just from the Cochrane database for preoperative carbohydrate loading in these patients. And um, what showed was the length of hospital stay favored the carbohydrate drink. And it's hard to see, but basically they had an almost two-day reduction in length of stay with the carbohydrate drink. Um, 
and um, basically the quality of these studies is still somewhat limited and it's not entirely clear what uh, how great an effect this might have if it were studied in a prospective randomized fashion but what it did show was that there was no increase in complications particularly in aspiration since that's often one of the concerns um, this is what we are using here at uh, at UC Davis, the Boost Breeze. Um, Linda and Jessica had us uh, test uh, multiple drinks and um, look at the cost, the protein to sugar ratio, the, the um, size, and um, the flavors. And this is the one that we uh, determined was uh, the one that we would purchase here for UC Davis. So for the last year or so, the patients have been uh, receiving this in their preoperative to go back. Um, with um, Dr. Uppington, who was also on the nutrition committee and the rest of the committee, we developed these contraindications to using the carbohydrate supplement. Um, we potentially, like for instance, insulin requiring diabetics, some show that you can actually do it, give it to diabetics, but since we're just rolling this out, we wanted to be relatively conservative with, uh, with our contraindications. And then um, as we see that patients do well, and but I still think that these are uh, a pretty good list of contraindications. Next, I wanted to briefly speak about post-op ileus, since that's one of the primary reasons that patients, particularly the colorectal patients, stay in the hospital uh, post-operatively. And there are many factors, of course, for post-op ileus. Um, one, of course, is the opioid receptors uh, located on the bowel. And um, the opioids uh, land on the GI mu uh, opioid receptor site, and uh, thus, of course, can cause this ilia. So alvimopam, which is Enteric, was developed in order to try to uh, mitigate the effects of the narcotics. And what, what it is is a competitive inhibitor on the mu opioid receptor uh, for, uh, for their narcotics. Um, so this just shows you that, that it does not reverse the effects of the opioid. The patient still had a similar pain score and needed the same um, amount of narcotics. So otherwise, in other words, we're not um, affecting their pain. Um, there were five multicenter randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trials, and there's a recent one also with cystectomies. The first doses has to be given preoperatively in order to have the alvimopan bind on the mu opioid receptor. And it, uh, you'll see contra one of the contraindications is someone who's used narcotics before. These are the studies, and essentially it shows that the patients um, have a uh, return of bowel function that's almost a, a day sooner than without Enteric. And what these studies all looked at was mean time to GI2 recovery. So in other words, um, they have tolerance of solid food and the first bowel movement, and that's when we stop the Enteric. So there, there was a, a study looking at the use of this for chronic constipation, long-term use, and they had an increased number of MIs, so they started this black box warning, everyone needs to be educated about it, and there's strict restrictions to how it's used. Uh, they don't actually think, they don't know exactly what the mechanism of action was, but they just said, look, we're just going to stop it and not give it uh, for these patients. This is, you don't have to read the details, but this is a letter that I wrote to the PNT committee to get um, Enteric onto the formulary. Essentially, I had to say we didn't have anything comparable that, that worked. Um, these are the reasons that it works. Here's the cost. Um, this is what I came up with. So cost per dose, uh, seven doses if they're using all the doses, which... Um, they, they don't use all the doses. 15 doses is 1580. Uh, cost of a Davis 12 bed, over 5,000. So you can see there's quite a savings, especially if we can get the patient out uh, one day sooner. We have to make sure we stop it um, before, um, uh, stop it once they have their bowel movements. So they get the one dose pre-op, seven doses BID post-op. And right now it's only allowed for elective colon resection with anastomosis. And uh, urology just had this approved for cystectomy patients. So what's important is they cannot have used the narcotics for a week before. They can't have severe hepatic in impairment, and stage renal disease, or complete bowel obstruction. So uh, other, other elements of the ERES program are multimodal pain management, just trying to think of other ways to avoid narcotics. Um, and then uh, determining if the patient has... Um, 
has nausea and vomiting propensity, and to look at risk factors. I fit into lots of these, female non-smoker, history of motion sickness, history of post op nausea vomiting. So it's basically, think of me, that then, you know, they're more likely to have uh, nausea vomiting. Um, and then, of course, MIS is always helpful if you can minimize um, the trauma to the patient. Uh, fluid management for both for our anesthesiologists as well as for us is extremely important to try to minimize um, the fluid given to these patients. Uh, and we look at it as a continuum. We try to keep the patient euvolemic if possible uh, because the, the extra fluid will just end up in their bowels and increase their ileus and length of stay. So for just a few uh, snips of the post-op order set that we created, or actually this is the one the day of surgery. Um, so this is, to, in order to get alvimapam, you either have to give them a verbal order or you have to use my order set. So um, this is basically uh, for the first pre-op dose and um, they'll, you'll ha you have to answer the questions, patient doesn't have liver disease, kidney disease, et cetera, in order to get the alvimapam. Here, IV Tylenol is another uh, med that we're trying to make sure that the patients get, and I remind the anesthesiologist every six hours, if it's a long case, did you give them another dose of IV Tylenol? And then um, I put the, uh, the antibiotics, including the, for those with beta-lactam allergies, Clinda and ace trianam, uh, according to weight. And uh, on the post-op order set, the completion of the 24-hour course of those latter two are on there as well. So I try to make the order set be sort of where everything comes together so you can remember everything. Um, in advance, of course, this has to be given one time. Now, in terms of the post-operative phase, um, again, education is extremely important, trying to get the patient out of bed, uh, resuming diet as soon as they're lucid and uh, alert. Um, no NG tube unless you absolutely need to have it. And uh, stopping the IV fluids as soon as the patient has had two cups. I show the patient, once you've had two cups of liquid, you can go on to your post-surgical diet, which is something else that we worked with with nutrition. Post-surgical diet is an, a nutritionally incomplete diet that's bland, low fat, and low fiber. Uh, but the, the goal is to, to move them forward as quickly as possible. The goal, again, to get them to their normal function. Um, What's important, too, is once we get to the floor, to make sure that we maintain this, this strict uh, watch of the IV fluids so that we don't overload our patients and keep them at 150 or 125 an hour for days. Just keep in mind, let's get those fluids down as soon as possible. So in regards to the low residue diet versus a clear liquid diet after surgery, uh, Lau et al. looked at 111 elective colorectal surgery patients that ra were randomized to one or the other. And the primary endpoint was vomiting after after uh, surgery on post-op day two. And so what they showed was on post-operative day one, uh, the patients who had the low residue diet had less nausea, a faster return of bowel function by almost a day, a shorter length of, di uh, length of stay by two days, but no increase in post-op morbidity. And some people think if you feed them too quickly, they're gonna vomit and aspirate or their anastomosis will fall apart, but it's okay. So I just uh, have to, it's studies like this, I think, just getting the awareness out that it's okay to advance them. There have been patients that have done well with this, I think gives us the, the courage to move forward. These, again, with the nutrition committee, we came up with some contraindications uh, and uh, concern for aspiration. One of the ones that I sometimes uh, abide by here is prolonged lysis of adhesions. If I had someone who had a multi-hour lysis of adhesions, I'm going to move relatively slowly with them. And then chewing gum, a lot of people get excited about this because they said, well, does it really make a difference? Uh, but you can see here with this forest plot, for time to first bowel movement was almost a day uh, sooner with chewing gum. Their length of hospital stay was almost uh, two days. And um, what was important was that the, they had the most impact on colorectal patients. And some of the other abdominal surgeries, there was not as great of an impact, but for colorectal surgery patients there was. And just to circle back to show you in the post-op phase that the dietitian consult would have been generated by the snack questionnaire um, 
two order sets ago um, if, if these patients are malnourished. What we're working on now with nutrition is trying to get before the hospitalization and after the hospitalization to, to continue with this uh, clear, clear watch of our patient's nutritional status. And just a few um, orders. Um, this is the clear liquid diet to advance as tolerated. We couldn't just say clear liquids advance as tolerated. The order set folks and the nutritionist said we had to have a starting diet, finishing diet, what the indications were to advance and what the indications were to stop. So you'll see that these are pre-checked on the order set. You can always uncheck them very easily. Um, so this is a, a chewing gum order. Davis 12, Mary Fong has it in her cabinet. And uh, the Alvimo Pam, there's a lot of stops that come up with that. So you have to make sure that um, you, you answer those questions um, in order to get it. And then for adult insulin dosing, this was a, uh, this, you'll just have to go to different order sets. Um, but I, we just have to make sure that that's also on there. So I just had that quick link to remind you to, um, to go to the order set as well. And this is just something posted at the workstations. Um, looks busy, but basically it goes through all of the components in case the residents forget anything um, or the, any of the other clinic personnel. Um, one brief word about readmission. Uh, some people think, well, if you send them home too soon, they're going to come back too soon. But that's actually not the case. It's the surgical or non-surgical complications that are the reason for people to return and not premature discharge from the hospital. Um, and really what it is, if the patient is lacking and knowing what to do, they're, well, I wasn't sure, is this how my stoma should look or how much urine output was I supposed to have? Often that's the reason they come back, because they're anxious and they are not well informed. So our goal is to really make sure our patient has as much information as possible. So I wanted to briefly show this to you. This is something that Allie gave me. She's, there she is, um, one of our nutritionists. I said, well, do you have a nice oral rehydration solution that we can give to the patients so they don't have to go and buy Gatorade or Pedialyte or overdose on water and have low sodium, um, something that's more consistent with our body makeup. And so she found this for us. These are just some oral rehydration solutions that we give to the patients who are at risk. Um, and I, I've given this actually to some of my inpatients for other reasons as well. So they can make these at home. Now what assessment tools are we using uh, for our project here? So uh, this group has already had a full data set for the colorectal cases for a number of years. And Kim Brink and Ann Martyr have been very helpful in the NISQIP to help us incorporate some that were specific to the CHQI to our grant. Basically, what we were looking at was some of the process measures. Did they have their diet advanced? Did they receive Entereg? Uh, so that we can see process steps and not just outcomes. We're also looking at patient satisfaction uh, data. We're just now going to start working on getting all of this data together, and um, so that's our next project. I just spoke with Dr. Stamos over the weekend, and so um, pretty much till this point, we've all been giving this big push to get the, um, the pieces in place, and uh, so we're excited to see what the outcomes will be. So just briefly, for those of you who are unfamiliar with NISQIP, it's a nationally validated risk-adjusted outcomes-based program that looks at surgical quality uh, between collaborating institutions. There's about 700 of, of these institutions um, that are collaborating. And the HCAPS is the patient's uh, questionnaire that's sent to the patients. The ones that we're, the questions we're using specifically for um, our project are these. Um, and basically they focus around communication and preparedness of the patient. So during your hospital stay, did the doctors explain things did you know what to look for? Did the staff listen to you and work with you to help you transition to home? And do you have a good understanding of, your, of how to manage your health? So uh, briefly and uh, in conclusion, I wanted to show you some meta-analysis of uh, colorectal ERAS outcomes that have been published. This one is, um, this was published in 2010, looking at six high quality randomized controlled trials with 452 patients. And uh, what they showed for length of hospital stay, you can see again the fourth plot, um, it's over two day reduction in the hospital stay if we follow some of these 
um, elements. Post-op complications are also significantly <coughs> reduced with the NERAS program. We did not see a significant uh, change in readmissions. You can see the forest plot uh, covers the, the line there. Nor did we uh, see a change in post-operative mortality with this program. So uh, in summary, decreased length of stay and decreased perioperative complications, readmissions were not increased, and mortality was unchanged. So it's also cost effective. Um, some more looked at 50 patients and had a control group of 50 match patients. And he also showed significant reduction in length of stay, IV fluid use, and complications with a savings uh, of over $5,000 per patient. Um, so how are we doing thus far? Um, we don't have all of the elements um, yet analyzed, but I can show you what um, uh, Kim recently shared with us. So just in briefly, we, we already saw an improvement in some of our NISQIP outcome as recent as 2010. So many, again, of these elements, many of the best practices were already in place here at UC Davis. So the goal was just to push this to, to a, the next level uh, and uh, you'll see as we uh, progress over the years, we see continued improvement. Um, and again, this is, of course, multifactorial. There have been many people who have been working on trying to get the word out about, um, about this. Surgical site infection continues to remain stable and, and go down. Um, urinary tract infection. This is all uh, through the mid of 2015. Um, return to operating room. And now these are just some of the more recent adjusted outcomes looking at specific uh, variables. We see um, in morbidity that we've really made some nice strides in uh, now we're in the top decile. Uh, we still have some room for improvement in the ventilator days and in the reintubation. We've done quite well in the UTIs and surgical site infection and sepsis. Oh, uh, where, where we, oh, actually the next, the next slide shows this, where um, this is actually something that we just saw for the first time at our last meeting. These are the five groups that are in the collaborative and we're the green. And so um, we're just looking at everyone's performance over the year uh, in NISQIP. And uh, what we can see, again, I, the groups, the areas where I mentioned we did well, where we also have some room for improvement is v, uh, VTE. Um, and Kim told me that there were just three or four patients in order in, who put us in this location. But I think, again, there's room for improvement. Um, so as I mentioned, Clifford Coe is coming next week. When we sat together and looked at these numbers and these uh, these values. What he said, well, it's good. There's a lot of variability. There's room for improvement. He's always an optimist. Well, not always. But, um, and he said the two best things we can work on are really pushing the enhanced recovery process and process measures. So, so identifying what it was that we did to help the patient. So again, did, did they do better by taking out their nasogastric tube? Did they do better by giving them Enteric? So not just looking at outcomes, but looking at what we did to the patient. One other thing we're also trying to identify is comparing slightly more apples to apples. Like a, a, a LAR for rectal prolapse is a different beast than an LAR in a patient with re low rectal cancer who's had pre-op radiation. So we're asking those kind of questions too. Uh, what were the minutes of enteral lysis? How many prior operations did the patients have? So really just getting a better use of the NISQIP database, which I think is phenomenal. and. Um, I know Dr. Holcroft has been very helpful in, in bringing us into the NISQIP world and in staying true to NISQIP, so um, thank you. So um, one other thing I want to say before I forget, I see Katrina, can you raise your hand over there? So Katrina is the research nurse that's really been instrumental in getting many of these, um, these projects yeah. underway. So what we briefly did was, at, at our last meeting, we went through um, all, all of the collaborators from the UCs went through all of the different steps. Uh, we started from the top, VTE. Who, 
who's um who's doing the best job and what are you all doing? Okay, you that are doing the worst job, what are you doing or not doing? So we basically went through each stage to determine how we can improve our practice. And I think that is one of the, the biggest joys for me is working with all of these 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 excellent um, colorectal surgeons and and seeing what we can do better, because I think there's always room for improvement. Um, Dr. Stamos takes the dirty instruments and walks them off the field, or has someone walk them off the field. Um, you know, do all, what is it that has made the improvement? It's hard to say exactly, but we're doing a better job. So uh, I think we just need to just do our best uh, to work on all these components, non-narcotic pain meds, having them eat, thinking about their mobilization, et cetera. I actually have also started um, giving my high-risk colorectal patients with inflammatory diseases such as Crohn's or, or diverticulitis heparin for one month postoperatively based on, on uh, our discussions at these meetings. So in summary, these are multimodal perioperative care protocols that are evidence-based. Multiple collaborators are necessary in order to have something like this implemented. And we do see some significant impacts on outcomes. And what is the future? Well, we're applying these now to other programs. I just worked with urology for a few hours to help them get the cystectomy protocol. Like they're, you know, they now have an order set as well. I, you know, help them to get entering on the formulary. There, uh, basically, there's an enter committee that Dr. Um, Uppington is chairing with, with uh, ERAS uh, interested physicians from multiple departments: gynonc, urology, neurosurgery, ENT. And everyone is trying to implement some form of an ERAS program. So even though they may not do colorectal surgery, many of these principles, as I've outlined, uh, are very consistent and can be applied to these other groups. Um, so the American College of Surgeons is also now coming on board. They've started an ERAS program. About a year after we started the UC program, they started to really uh, push it and come out with, with a protocol as well, which is very similar to what we're doing here. So thank you very much. Any questions for me? I think I covered it all. Actually, many of these components can be an entire presentation in and of themselves. I just really wanted to give you a, a broad overview. And the next one will be the outcomes when we analyze all the data. You know, Catherine, I just want to really want to thank you again for what is a great effort and really the hard work of getting this, of not just wanting to do this, but getting it into our electronic medical record system. I mean, that just was an enormous amount of heavy lifting to sort of make that work. So, Well, th you. there were many people that helped, and uh, IR, uh, the IT EMR people were very helpful as well in that regard. It's, it's not easy to make a change, as you guys all know, in, the, in our system. So to get that through is really great. So just thank you so much for that effort. I think... You know, are, how many people were aware of ERAS uh, before this presentation? So it's sort of gotten out there, which is which is really great. And I think that um, having the ability, you know, a system only works if you not just you know write it on some website, but get it done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Questions, Gordon? Oh, that's a great idea. Um, yeah, was, I guess Sacramento had a big pain in my and a lot of time with trauma. It would be really useful to have yeah. some of that. I'm sure there's one. That's a wonderful idea. I don't think that was even um, considered, but yeah. And even the spiral notebook, that, that would definitely be easy to translate. And, you know, yeah. I bet another place we could think if we couldn't get a grant for it would be to think about having Yeah, um, I bet great. you could get that at least done initially. It might have to officially be done later, but they could get that started. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. Well, I will definitely bring that up to our to our collaborators. I think that's a great suggestion. Yes. I'm sure it's hard enough to get the surgeons to follow these because everybody's their own opinion. But what about other surgeons like anesthesia? How do they buy off on you know liquids of couple hours before surgery? I know 
progressive anesthesiologists will agree with that. A lot of guys won't, and then they'll cancel your case and stuff. So. Yeah, that, that was certainly one of my concerns, especially with um, the boost breeze, you know, because you don't want them to cancel your case. But they had Dr. Uppington, who is on the, one of the anesthesiologists, um, he has he's very much an advocate for this and I've given a grand rounds and Dr. Antonini and Norma Klein and Hugh Liu there's a lot of anesthesiologists and I think because everyone is doing it now but what we have to understand is they you know they say well you've had a bowel prep our patients dry we have to you know but what they're doing with this goal directed therapy is they're using the Frank Starling curve and stroke volume index if they can um, in order to see you know if the patient is still uh, you know, on the on the curve. So, they're believe it or not, they're buying into it. I because and and as a matter of fact, about half a year ago, I went to a grand rounds uh, that Dr. Flynn told me about um, for the anesthesia department, and there was a an anesthesiologist who worked who was a PI with a surgeon for all of Great Britain, and they basically there they can do like kind of father down. They're saying this is what you're doing. So they went to all like the major surgeons in in uh, Great Britain and they all did this and their length of stay was down to three days and so I think that the anesthesiologists also appreciate um, what's going on um, I, I do think a lot of it is 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 bowel function but I do think that um, not overloading the patient makes a big difference in fact, there's some environments where the anesthesiologists want to own it even more and the whole sort of perioperative home conversation that occurring in the anesthesia world is significant. So I think it's important for, I think it's in the best interest of patients for both the surgeons yeah. and the anesthesiologists to be involved. Mohammed. I think a lot of that of um, these are certainly surgeon dependent and it, people have a different way of practicing. I think that's the beauty of surgery is that there's an art to surgery and you still have a certain way you like to practice. Um, if if Dr. X wants to leave the nasogastric tube in longer, it's okay. If if the patient didn't get the enteric because they had previously been on narcotics, it's all right. You can skip some of the elements and it doesn't mean your patient didn't get the ERAS program. Um, I think it's I think it's just the awareness that there that that this is a comprehensive program and just doing as many of the elements as you're comfortable with is what matters. Like maybe you don't want to give toradol because non steroidals are another component of this, non narcotic um, but if you don't want to do that, that's okay. But I think just having people aware that they can do these things and they're not going to harm the patient by feeding them or by taking their catheter out too soon or soon. So, Linda, you had a question. Everybody's grabbing their food with certain 
<laughs> yeah. Right, beautifully because, said. You know, Garth doesn't run a marathon without training. The, the physiologic stress of having a big operation is not that insignificant, at least some training. <laughs> um, and so the notion of training in advancement operations is well, that's, that's um, something one of the um, colorectal surgeons at UCSF is working on, Emily Finlinson, um, is prehab and geriatric care. Basically, really pushing the patients beforehand for um, physical endurance, making sure that they walk a few times a day, that they get a protein supplement for a few weeks before surgery, uh, and, you know, these kind of things. I've pushed the IS just to get them to be familiar with it so that anything that we can do to improve the patient uh, in advance, we potentially can. Does someone have a question over here? Yes. Well, there, no, no, not that we think that there is going to be uh, an effect on anastomosis leak dependent on the on the timing of the oral intake. But one of the reasons people used to say, well, I don't want to feed him too soon. I, you know, I want to protect the anastomosis. There's just no, there's no evidence to that. It, it, that's hard to know. I don't know if Dr. Kokenauer was going to confront this uh, recently, but I think that that's multifactorial too. And, but, um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. What's the collaborative strategy for uh, analyzing and documenting uh, uh, compliance? So not only compliance on the institutional end, but you mentioned, you know, Dr. X may not like the new tears or may want to keep the new tears. How do you know? Well, the, I'll start with the latter. In terms of the patient, you know, we you can only bring the bring the horse to water, so to speak. I mean, we give them all the information, and we we hope that they look at that, but we we can't force it. There is one the Emmy colorectal video. We are able to see how long the patient watches it. So this is something that there's a company named uh, called Emmy sends to the patients in advance and has some of, the, some of the things that we have on our video. There's also a new ileostomy video for them. But they can tell us, your patient watched 25% of this video. Um, you know, and I asked them. There's also a great American College of Surgeons box set that has a video and a spiral, has a little styrofoam ostomy and some bags, uh, you know, so they can practice. And I have them wear their stoma. So you don't really know, um, but you just, do as much, I think, repetitive. In, in the clinic, I tell them about it. I give them some paperwork. I give them, you know, we, we do it again in the hospital. So I, I think just trying to target it from as many ends and, and emphasizing the importance of them reviewing that information. Um, in terms of the other elements, for we there are some NISQIP uh, databases, uh, on the database, some elements that the NISQIP nurses are collecting to, like, you know, de the day that the diet was advanced, what was this medication given? Um, you know, things like that. So some of those things we're collecting. The other were just, you know, we don't know, for instance, um, that they sat in the chair six times. You know, so some of these things we don't, we're not measuring that. We just have to keep reminding people and posting it and, you know, just trying. And that's why the order set is one way that I try to get as much of it together in that spot, because that we can track. And that helps people to remember what to do. Well, thank you again, Catherine. It's really been a great. Welcome.